and we'll attend to that. We want to quickly go to our next speaker. We'll be bringing in Mrs. Charity Babatunde, who will be talking with us on why we should teach digital citizenship in our classrooms. So please, let's quickly have her here on board. Are you there, Ma? Yes, I am. Good afternoon. Yes, Ma. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Ma. So, so sorry to keep you waiting. So we want you to just quickly carry us through your presentation, which is why we should teach digital citizenship in every classroom. I know you have been a forerunner of this for a while, for a long while, and you are, you are one of the best people I know in that space talking about it. So we'd like for you to explain to us why digital citizenship should be taught in classrooms. Why do students need to know about digital citizenship and why do teachers have to teach it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you please allow me to share my screen? Um, I don't know if I can do. OK, sure. yeah, sure. OK. So. Yes, 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 you well, can. So thank you very yes. much. To all the speakers who have gone ahead of me and well done for the um, summit that has been put together. I like what the last speaker said. I don't want to murder her name, so I'm not going to attempt pronouncing it, but I liked what she said about um, technology being the pen and paper of our time. And whether we realize it or not, right, we're actually, we have absolutely no choice but to use technology, especially in the classroom. Um, one of the things that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic showed was that te technology has permeated every aspect of our lives. So some of the very mundane things that we hitherto would not have used technology to do, especially in Nigeria, we're having to fall back um, to using, to use it, we're, we're having to use technology. Now, one of the places that we were not very well prepared for was in the classroom and schools. Because while the world was making progress and changing the method that they used to teach, which was why um, I think Uwai Shoyetan's um, presentation was quite interesting. We were busy um, teaching our children to memorize and do a lot of things. Now, these same children who are digital natives and who make use of technology, found out that they could use technology for a myriad of things. So while they may not have access to laptops, ev virtually every one of them, regardless of where you are, whether you're in the urban or rural area, have access to a telephone. And that telephone exposes them to the digital world. Now, one of the paradoxes of technology is that even though we are getting more connected, we can interact with people, there's more, we're getting more connected, we're also getting more disconnected. Um, by way of a very short introduction, one of the things I'm passionate about is um, I'm very passionate about values. And part of my dream is to see Nigeria become a nation where success is driven by values. And it is my quest for looking at how we can involve the right kind of values in different aspects of our lives that actually drove my interest in digital citizenship. Because what then happens is that because of the seeming anonymity that the screen gives to people, a lot of um, uncivilized and um, poor citizenship begins to take place in the digital world. And that will really be the premise of my conversation. But so that we're all on the same page, when we talk about digital citizenship, what exactly are we talking about? I know a um, lot of the other speakers have looked at different aspects of it. One would be the definition by Mike Ribble, which says that digital citizenship is the norms of appropriate, responsible behavior with regard to technology use. So yes, there are nine elements of digital citizenship and there are different aspects. I want to focus more on the value aspect of it, the values aspect of it, and the digital, how digital citizenship education would help. One of the things that um, digital citizenship education does is it encourages and amplifies the importance of living positive values offline and online. And that's because you can't be one thing um, offline and be another thing online. So it promotes civility in the digital space. Um, it's important that we continually empower our children with the competencies that they need to do life and to thrive successfully in this age that we're in. 
So access to technology, the connectedness, how to behave, what to do, it's all part of this digital story that we're telling. If you, if um, I, I can't remember who it was that I listened to or I read, who said, putting a phone in the hands of a child is like putting, and re, without teaching them about digital citizenship and how to be responsible in that place, is like giving them a gun and telling them, not telling them the implications of shooting. Um, according to the Council of Europe, digital citizenship education focuses on teaching students to work, live, and share in digital environments in a positive way. And that again is very important for us to, um, for us to note. Now, I, um, I run an organization called Rave et al. And one of the, Rave et al was um, appointed as the DQ ambassador. DQ is digital intelligence quotient. We're appointed as the DQ ambassador, the first in Africa and the DQ ambassador for Nigeria. So since 2017, we've been very involved in um, talking about digital citizenship, explaining why it's important and we begin to teach our children from a very early age, the importance of um, having the right values in the digital space and staying safe. Now, one of the things that we did in 2019 and our organization was uh, very involved in, in Nigeria, was working with the Digital DQ Institute globally to um, come up with a child online safety index. So we did a lot of surveys in Nigeria so that we would have records of what exactly happened in Nigeria. And the reason was because it was getting um, very tiring speaking to parents who felt that the issue of digital citizenship didn't really affect, sorry, I apologize, I must have mistakenly pressed something, that it didn't really affect um, their children in Nigeria and that it was, um, it was kind of like a misnomer that no, our children are not this, our, our children are not that. And that drove my interest in finding out what exactly the reality is. So we've been involved in two surveys. The last one we did was in 2019. And um, DQ Institute came out with the 2020 Child Online Safety Index, which was founded on, um, it was to measure the level of online safety and digital citizenship for children across the world based on six pillars, cyber risk, discipline, digital usage, digital competency, guardians and education, social infrastructure and connectivity. And children and educators were surveyed. About 145,000 children were surveyed in um, 30 countries across the world. And um, these are the results for Nigeria. Of the 30 countries, Nigeria, um, placed 18th, um, we're average, average compared to the other 13, uh, sorry, to the other um, 29 countries. Globally, 60% of our children age eight to 12 um, are exposed to different kinds of online risk. But when we come to Nigeria specifically, what were the findings? One, like I said, Nigeria ranked 18 out of the 30 with an overall score of 37.7 were classified as being at the lower end of an average performance. In terms of connectivity, which we've all talked about and talking about digital access, Nigeria is very, very, very low. And there's need for clear improvement in that area for us to be able to unlock the potentials. In terms of disciplined usage, Nigeria didn't do badly at all. We came seventh, which um, we scored we, well, seventh out of the 29 countries, which is not surprising when you look at our parenting style in Nigeria. So we tend to um, enforce a lot of things and it's not, a, it's, it's not a laissez faire type of parenting. We tend to enforce a lot of things. I think this gives a clear picture. The cyber risk, um, 18th discipline usage, seven, um, digital competency, 13, guardians and education, 10, social infrastructure, 15, connectivity, 29. This kind of gives an idea of the areas that we need to focus on. And so we have our children increasingly living a digital life, navigating seamlessly between the physical and digital world. And at no time has um, a better opportunity been presented for us to promote ideas around the subject of digital citizenship and civility as now. Now that we are being forced, we, we all hope that um, the COVID 
COVID-19 situation will come to an end. But we're hearing about second wave and third wave in many countries. So we don't know how far this will go. What happens when our children do not have access to technology, access to learning? And don't forget the world has become a global village. So what then happens when we find out that we're at the um, bottom rung of the ladder, our children who are exceedingly brilliant are not able to compete um, equally with other people in other countries who are several steps higher than we are in, um, in, in the use of technology and knowing how to use it um, to the best interest and to use tech for good. Now, the issue of digital citizenship and digital citizenship education is not one for just the, the teachers. And I like the question, I think it was Mr. Sani asked that he, um, or he, the comment he made about parents being involved. All stakeholders must be involved. The last speaker talked about it being multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral. Everybody has to be involved in the um, quest for empowering our children with the digital citizenship skills that they need. Education provides all round development. That's what it's supposed to be. So education is not just about getting the technical details, but it's all round. And with technology being more integrated in our classrooms, it stands to reason that at no time than now should we be talking to our children about how to be responsible digital citizens. Now, one of the questions I have gotten asked as I um, go around schools or before the COVID used to go around schools is that, look, is that, should that be our responsibility in the school? Shouldn't it be the parents who should focus on making sure that their children imbibe the right kind of values? Now, the reality on ground in Nigeria is that our children pen, spend more time in school than they do more of their active time in school than they do at home. By the time you factor in traffic and you factor in so many other things that they have to do, they get home, they barely have two hours with their parents before it's time to go to bed. That's if their parents have not been stuck in traffic to even be able to get to them. Yes, I know that we do not have enough of laptops. I know that we do not have enough of, we don't have the kind of access that we would, but every virtually, virtually every Nigerian has access to a phone and access to an internet enabled phone. So what that means is we do have access to the digital world and we can begin to teach. So for the parents on the platform, it is not the sole responsibility of the classrooms. However, because classrooms are custodians and schools are custodians of education and um, education has to be a lot more integrated. It's important that we begin to um, infuse the lessons of good digital citizenship into the classroom. Another reason why classrooms need to embrace this is because the classrooms are actually like a melting pot of experiences. So you have different children from different homes who have had different encounters. And the best way to teach sometimes is to pick some of the experiences that the children have had, whether it's with um, the digital footprints or with um, cyber, cyber fraud issues. I can't remember who it was. I think it was Mrs. Shreton who was speaking and she mentioned something about the disparity between the private and the public schools. It is huge and we cannot afford to ignore the public schools. One of the unfortunate things, Nigeria is, a, is an immensely blessed country. However, we have gotten some negative um, publicity, especially with regards to cyber crime. Unfortunately, the people who tend to be involved in cybercrime tend to the people tend to be people who are um, disadvantaged financially. So we can't even shut our eyes to not passing on the information to them. So whether it's a public school or a private school, the opportunities exist. We just have to get more creative in teaching them the digital citizenship skills that um, that that they need to learn. Now. What are some of the advantages of teaching digital citizenship? It creates awareness of the cyber risks, digital harassment, grooming, ways to mitigate them. It helps children understand the implications and consequences of their actions online. I've had too many cases, more cases than I want to imagine, of children whose um, 
who have either posted their, their nude pictures online and have gotten into very precarious situations, whose um, admissions into schools have been affected. Another advantage is that um, internet, intentionally and systematically, we're able to reinforce responsible behavior online. It minimizes the trail of negative digital footprints. It improves physical, mental, and emotional health and well-being. It exposes children to the immense potential of using tech for good, and it encourages inclusiveness and equips our children to participate productively and globally. Um, now, like we've, we've talked about the fact that it is multi-stakeholder, and it's, it, it, all of us, every single um, sector has a part to play. For pa parents, they need to ensure that the schools are delivering on what it is, but you really can't give what you have. So the, the teachers have to be equipped and be in a position to actually pass on the information. Now, how do we go about doing this? One is to integrate digital citizenship education from as early as possible in a child's academic life. So a child who is able to operate a phone is able to learn the core principles and the core values of being a responsible digital citizen online. It's important we involve all stakeholders. I've said that before. Our teachers must be equipped. And um, I liked what Mrs. Shreton said about teachers being self-driven. Yes, part of the problem, I think, is that we're waiting for somebody to do something for us. And we can't, uh, th those times are gone. Yes, there's a responsibility of the owners of the school. There's a responsibility of government. But there's also a responsibility that we have as individuals to develop ourselves. If not, we will find out that the skills that we possess are no longer relevant for the 21st century and beyond. So it's important that we continue to empower ourselves and as school owners, we empower the children, the um, teachers too. It's also important that we seize um, teachable moments, um, integrating different, the project-based learning, where you're able to capture various things and various topics and integrate them into the classroom would go a long way. Digital citizenship education provides an anchor for equipping our children with the critical life skills and competencies that they need to make safe and responsible choices that have far reaching implications on their future. It's our children's most critical skills. And if we do not all get involved, classrooms, teachers, parents, government, corporate organizations, at the end of the day, we will be the ones to suffer for it because the implications of the incivility that can take place in that space can be far reaching, not just for the children, but for the general society. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't exceeded my time. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you very much, Ma. That was quite informing. So as we can all see and hear and know, we've known that digital citizenship is not just about our, the teachers. Parents on their own we also have to learn how to equip and train our kids to be responsible digital citizenship. Mrs. Um, Baba Kimbe has said it all. We all, everyone has to get involved. It's not just about one person, one individual, one corporate organization. We all have to get involved. Thank you so much, Ma.